Monday, October 22, 1934. Public enemy number one, Pretty Boy Floyd, who is wanted for bank robbery, murder, and other charges, has been on the run from law enforcement. His pursuers are the Bureau of Investigations and local law enforcement. Leading the Bureau is Melvin Purvis from the Chicago branch. They have cornered Pretty Boy Floyd just outside of East Liverpool, Ohio, on a farm owned by the Conkle family. Floyd is fatally shot twice in a hail of gunfire from both the G-Men and local law enforcement. Welcome back to a very special episode of Revamping History. As usual, I'm Roy, that's my brother Jesse, and for this episode we got to interview an FBI agent about the death of Pretty Boy Floyd. This interview was considered off the record, but we were able to use a lot of the information gained to cross-reference some of the sources within this video. So with that being said, before we go any further, let's go back and see how Pretty Boy Floyd's criminal career began. Charles Arthur Floyd was born on Wednesday, February 3, 1904, in Adersville, Georgia. Floyd's family moved to Atkins, Oklahoma in 1911, where he grew up. Floyd was arrested when he was 18 years old for stealing $3.50 from a post office. By 1929, Floyd was wanted in numerous cases. Floyd was arrested in Akron, Ohio on Saturday, March 8, 1930, under the name Frank Mitchell. He was charged for the murder of an Akron, Ohio police officer. Floyd would eventually escape from prison and was once again on the run. Pretty Boy Floyd hid out for a while in Buffalo, New York. On Thursday, October 18, 1934, Floyd and his friend Adam Rochetti and two women companions left Buffalo, New York and started heading back towards Oklahoma. It started here with Floyd Rochetti, Adam Rochetti, which you don't hear a whole lot about, but Adam Rochetti was his partner and he had ties to Dillonvale, which is on the other side of Steubenville. He had family down there and uh, that's where they were headed before they were going back to Oklahoma. They had been in Buffalo, New York for a year. You know, prior to this, not getting in any trouble, they decided to go back to Oklahoma, and you'll hear of Coontz Avenue a lot about the Floyd stuff. Well, that was Route 7, you know, then, and they come down 30 into Route 7 to go, the, I assume, to Dillonvale, and they crashed. It's 3 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday morning, it's foggy from the river, and Floyd's driving, and he hit a telephone pole and broke the axle on the car. Dumb luck. You know, he ends up there at Wellsville at the Silver Switch. Chief Fultz, we have his story, and he gets in a gunfight with these, and there's, there's some fun backstories to all of it, but um, he gets in a gunfight right there at the Silver Switch with, uh, um, with Floyd and Rochetti, not knowing who they are. They, they don't know that that's who they're, they're with. They're just two men with guns. And uh, it's not till later they determine who the heck they are. And, uh, and the story just evolves, I mean, and it's great but it tells all of it here you know in these transcripts which are which are cool or the documentary now so the last run of pretty boy floyd is the documentary the last run of pretty boy floyd is an excellent documentary about the events surrounding the final days and death of pretty boy floyd this documentary features expert historians and includes kelsey hedrick and tim brooks that you will hear from later in this video to learn more about other details and forensics Make sure to watch this documentary from 28th Parallel Productions and directed by David Dunlap. You can buy your own copy by visiting the East Liverpool Police Museum in East Liverpool, Ohio. After the shootout in Wellsville, Floyd and Rochetti became separated. After several more incidences involving both civilians and law enforcement, Floyd was making his way closer to Lisbon, Ohio. Um, if you're familiar where uh, uh, Pondy's is, well, Pondy's restaurant was around then. It, it's over 100 years old. And that bridge right beside Pondy's is where Floyd, and after he kidnapped the guy named Baum, took his car, they, Baum's driving, and they're coming down that way. And when the police were blocking the bridge, he made them turn around, they went after him. It turns into a gunfight in Lisbon at uh, Roller Coaster Road, so Stooksbury Road, on the roller coaster right there. That was known as Spence's Woods. They get into a gunfight there, and Floyd takes off in the woods. The next day, he ends up at the Robinson Farm on Bell School Road in Calcutta, and then makes his way to Conkle Farm. Floyd arrived at the back door of the Conkle House at approximately 2.50 p.m. 
Floyd asked the owner of the home, Ellen Conkle, for some meat and potatoes. Ellen Conkle agreed to feed Floyd and invited him into her home. Floyd told Conkle that he was hunting and was lost. Conkle didn't believe Floyd's story, but still agreed to make him the meal. Ellen Conkle then prepared pork chops, potatoes, and rice pudding. Floyd ate the meal, with the exception of the rice pudding. Floyd then stated that this was a meal fit for a king. Floyd then gave Ellen Conkle one dollar and asked if she could drive him to Youngstown. Ellen Conkle explained that she was unable to give Floyd a ride, but if he waited for her brother to return, that he may be able to give Floyd a ride in his car. When the widow Conkle's brother finished whatever he was doing in the, the fields, he came to the house and uh, Charlie met him and said, I'd, I'd pay you for a ride to, to Youngstown. Still, you know, wanting to go to Youngstown. Um, and the guy said, well, I'm not going to go that far, but he said, you can ride along with me in that general direction. And so it was Floyd and, and uh, the brother, whose name was Stuart Dyke and Mrs. Dyke. Um, the three of them were, were in the car and they started to pull out. And just at that time, two carloads of, of East Liverpool police officers and bureau agents, including Melvin Purvis, came down the Sprucevale Road. They had been out on, on these wild goose chases, which is pretty descriptive of all the activity that had taken place since the escape in, in the Lisbon area. When the agents and East Liverpool officers saw Dyke's car pull out, stop, and back up behind the corn crib, it aroused their suspicion. So they pulled into the driveway at the Conkle farm and got out. There were, as best I can tell, eight, off, eight men in the, the two police cars, equally divided amongst members of the Liverpool Police Department and Bureau agents. And they kind of formed a a uh, line and approached the spot where this they saw that a man had gotten out of the car they could see his feet beneath a corn crib um, as he walked back and forth and they called on him to come out and uh, instead he he ran and uh, basically there was uh, a fair amount of gunfire uh, directed towards this man. Uh, he did not fire back. He, he was trying to put distance between him and the, and the posse. And um, at one point he, he fell and then got up and, and ran a little further and fell again. While Pretty Boy Floyd was down on the ground, Curly Montgomery kicked a 45 caliber pistol from Floyd's hand. Another 45 caliber pistol was then removed from Floyd's waistband by Herman Roth. Purvis asks if he is Pretty Boy Floyd. Floyd says, that's me, I'm Charles Arthur Floyd. Purvis then asks Floyd if he was present at the Kansas City Massacre. Floyd responds with profanities and denies any involvement. Uh, Melvin Purvis, who was the agent in charge, uh, left to, to drive to a little town called Clarkson where they were hoping to find a telephone. And it, it's amazing when you think, you know, less than a hundred years ago that was the state of technology that you had to hope there would be a telephone a um, couple miles up the road. So he left and uh, along with one of the uh, one of the other bureau agents, and they went up to call uh, Hoover. And they, they told Hoover that, uh, that they got their man, and in the meantime, Floyd died uh, lying alongside the, the road. Uh, eventually, they loaded him into one of the vehicles uh, in the back seat, sitting up between uh, two of the Liverpool officers, and drove him back to East Liverpool, where they took him to the Sturgis funeral home. At the Sturgis Funeral Home in East Liverpool, Floyd's body was first embalmed and then an autopsy was performed in that order. Floyd's body was then prepared and put on display for the public to view. It also became a photo opportunity for many local lawmen and others in the East Liverpool community. He was shot twice, he was hit twice, but he had six holes in him. And that's because the first round went into his forearm, come out of his forearm, into his side and out of his side. So he had four holes from one round. And then 
he shot again a little lower and at a higher angle would come out and that's the one that actually killed him. Now, however, there was a BB in his back and that's a result of the shootout at the Silver Switch in Wellsville. Um, Grover Potts, one of the guys, shot him in the back or shot at him with a shotgun, a 12-gauge shotgun, and they did find a BB in the center of his back. And there's blood in one of the car's seats that he was in later, and so they, you can figure out where that had occurred at. We're here at the Sturgis house here in East Liverpool. This is where the autopsy and public viewing took place of Pretty Boy Floyd. Now let's go to our friend Jericho Robinson, who had a personal experience when he stayed here at the bed and breakfast. What's up, y'all? This is Jericho, and this is my Pretty Boy Floyd story. So, uh, since a young kid, I've been intrigued by uh, Mobster, the Mafia, and uh, my grandfather, I got it from him. And uh, when I was young, he gave me a book called Blood Letters and Bad Men. I still have that book to this day. Probably not the best book to give a young kid, but anyways. And I had stories of every mobster, Pretty Boy Floyd, uh, Al Capone, you know, John Dillinger, you name it, and uh, Babyface Nelson. Um, had them all. Uh, but uh, I was in um, Ohio and I was speaking uh, at a church and uh, we were talking about history and stuff like that. And they said, you know, the next town over is where they shot uh, Pretty Boy Floyd. And I was like, are you serious? And they said, yeah. And uh, if you can see that poster over there, they shot a documentary about it. Well, I got a hold of the guy that was the closest uh, to tell me the true story about all this. So... His name is Mr. Dawson, and Mr. Dawson's dad is the one who embalmed Pretty Boy Floyd. And the story goes, he told me that uh, his dad got the call. They shot him not too far from there and uh, was killed. And uh, they get him in there, um, they embalm him, and then back in the day, they didn't have TV like they do nowadays. There's radio and stuff like that. If you had TV, it was kind of a special deal. So to see a dead body of a famous person was like a huge, huge deal. So he sent a telegram to uh, Pretty Boy Floyd's mom, and uh, his mom said, just do me a favor, don't let no one see the body. And he said by that time, there had been 14,000 people come in and out of the funeral home that had already seen the body. People were trying to cut hair, take pictures, this and that. And Mr. Dawson still to this day has the death mask, um, which I've seen and, and held uh, pretty, pretty crazy. Um, but... The funny thing was, is where he was embalmed, you, they turned into a bed and breakfast, and uh, it had been closed down for years. And um, they said, hey, do you want to stay the night here at the bed and breakfast? And I was like, yes, yeah, cool. But to be honest, I was really scared. And uh, I didn't know, but Mr. Dawson had talked about when they were shooting that documentary, the actor that was playing Pretty Boy, they were going to have him walk into the... Uh, the uh, the funeral home, the bed and breakfast in the middle of the night and scare me. And I told Mr. Dawson, I said, listen, man, I'm not being funny. If you do that, I will break down a wall or a window, but I will get out of this place alive. Please don't do that unless you want something broke. And so they didn't do it. Uh, thank goodness to go where he was actually shot. And I just went around there and walked around and just thought to myself, back in that day, this guy's on the run comes out and uh, gets ambushed. Um, crazy story. And what an ending to a story and to a life of, uh, you know, being on the run and, and committing crime and being on the run. Um, however bad it was, it's so intriguing though to me, the lives that they lived. But uh, what experience it was to go to East Liverpool and be where he was embalmed and go to that little, uh, uh, um, you know, embalming room where this happened and see the death mask. And uh, what a crazy story. At the same time, he's going, you got Ma Barker, you got uh, Dillinger, you got all these people. And um, they were just living a, a wild life of crime and running. And I can only imagine that you had really in your mind while you're doing all this, there was really no peace. You know, you might rob a bank, you might do this, you might do that. But there was, had to be no peace because you were constantly on the go and on the run and could never really settle down. So that's one of my Pretty Boy Floyd stories. I hope you enjoy it. I know that uh, their stories are 
you know, the modern day Robin Hood and it affected my life and I've always been interested in it in uh, every way. We also had the opportunity to speak with Lisbon's mayor, Peter Wilson, about his family members' experiences during the manhunt for Pretty Boy Floyd. When the news came out that Pretty Boy Floyd, they thought, had law enforcement were to, had told the outlying regions, look out for, you know, they must have put out an all points bulletin or something saying, hey, Pretty Boy Floyd is in the area, we need your help. So my father and my uncles, they were part of the posse from Lisbon. They came, I don't know what, my father must have had just a hunting rifle. He didn't have a pistol or anything, but he told me that he and his brothers went down to East Liverpool armed with hunting rifles, I guess, to help them look for Pretty Boy Floyd. Thankfully, they never found him. <laughs> they never found him. And by the time they got there, Pretty Boy Floyd had already been killed. But it was funny because my father said after the fact that in Columbiana County, especially down toward East Liverpool, people after the were selling vials of what they purported to be Pretty Boy Floyd's blood. And my dad said it was really funny because they were killing chickens, using the blood from the chickens to fill these bottles and then charging them like 25 cents a little vial of Pretty Boy Floyd's blood. So at the time, I mean, Pretty Boy Floyd was like a folk hero for many people. He was, I mean, he was robbing banks. The story was that he was robbing the rich and giving to the poor. I don't know if there's documentary proof to that effect, but that's what the story was, that he was a, a Robin Hood. A, a, and in the midst of the Depression, when so many banks had foreclosed on people's properties, what have you, he was a folk hero to many. So this was the second uh, public enemy number one in a row that Purvis had been directly present and responsible for. And that, that, that drew the ire of Hoover. Suddenly this agent is getting more public attention than Hoover was getting. And uh, that was pretty much the beginning of the, the end of uh, Melvin Purvis's ascendancy within the Bureau of Investigation. Because he was, he was just getting too much attention from the press and Hoover did not like it. So um, uh, anyway, after all these, uh, all these people you know, went through and saw the body, um, eventually uh, he was uh, crated up and, and sent by train. They, they put him on a train down here at the Penzi Station down uh, by the wharf area in the city. And he went up to Allegheny and then they switched him on trains or whatever and he went to Oklahoma. Yeah. Of interest, the two women who were with them arrived back in Oklahoma in time to go to the funeral. Which is still holds the world's record for the largest funeral in Oklahoma. And um, the two women that were with them, Rose and Beulah Baird, um, they were gun malls. They were kind of, I don't want to say hookers, but they were girls that run around with bad guys. Now, later on, they, the two, the, the Baird sisters were, were taken into custody and questioned extensively, but uh, um, I don't think they, nothing, uh, they didn't serve long sentences for anything. They just, just had questionable taste in men. And um, both of them died relatively young of uh, you know, various diseases. And uh, um, Rachetti, however, was, was still in custody. And uh, Purvis wanted to take him back you know, with him. And at that point, uh, the chief, Chief Foltz, decided he was going to get his revenge on, on Purvis, who he, he claimed had treated him in a high-handed manner. And so when Purvis requested the prisoner, he said, no, he's going to have to wait around here and, and, and be tried for his crimes in Columbiana County, which weren't much. Um, and eventually they had to get a federal judge involved to order that, that Rachetti be turned over to the, the Bureau. All right, so now we're gonna show you guys some of our items from the Revamping History collection. And this first item here is an old newspaper. This is called the Knickerbocker Press out of Albany, New York. And it basically just, you know, accuses Pretty Boy Floyd of being part of the Kansas City Massacre 
and maybe I think it names Adam Rochetti as well. Even though it turns out maybe there wasn't much evidence against them for that, but yeah, and that's what actually leads to him being well, public enemy number one. So it's a pretty important piece of information right there. And another good thing about all these old newspapers is that if you flip through the other articles, you get to take a little look into the little life and the culture that people had back in you know 1933. And it's real interesting. All right, and then this next item is gonna be a New York Times. It's another old newspaper here. Let's see, and this one's gonna be from October 22nd, 1934. You know, pretty, it says that Pretty Boy Floyd has been spotted in Wellsville, Ohio. And at this point, Floyd hasn't been killed yet, but he was still making the news already about this. And they believe that Floyd was wounded at that point, which he actually had a little bit of a buckshot in him from the first gunfight that he was in. But yeah, by the time this article ran, Pretty Boy Floyd would have been dead, but that's how long it takes for news to travel and everything back then. And again, New York Times, a lot of interesting articles inside this one too. Kind of shows a lot about you know, J.C. Penney's like, um, advertisement where it shows different styles they had back then. And yeah, almost a lot of people seemed to dress almost like gangsters back then. It's almost like if you had money, that's how you dressed. All right, and the third newspaper, it's gonna be a Plattsburgh Daily Press. And this one came out on October 23rd, 1934. And it, th this one, it says about how pretty boy Floyd has been killed and they believe that his body was riddled with bullets. So that's already one of these conspiracy theories already starting already. And that's probably how a lot of that idea about him being riddled was getting pushed from some of these stores. And said he was riddled with bullets, but he was actually only shot twice. But still like, very interesting and has a picture there of Adam Rochetti too, his partner. Yeah. All right, this next piece is a True Detective magazine. And this one comes from March of 1935. You know, it's interesting, it's only 25 cents back then. But yeah, it has a nice article in here about Pretty Boy Floyd. Kind of talks about him here a little bit. There's an article written by Hubert Dale. And yeah, some of the information is pretty much off on this. You know, a lot of this is, is incorrect, but it's nice to see what was going on back then. And this is still in pretty good shape. It's almost like a, like a comic magazine or something, but yeah, it shows definitely like um, the, you know, how, the difference in times back then. Because if you look on the back, you know, there's a commercial here for some Chesterfield cigarettes. Yeah, that's interesting. But yeah, this would have been real interesting to read probably, you know, when it first came out, you know, to be a teenager or a young person to read this. Probably Pretty Boy Floyd's story was pretty interesting. All right, our next item is that we have a, we have four of these G-Men trading cards. It actually came in packs of gum back in the day. I think these ones are from 1936. But they have a depiction on there of the a pretty boy Floyd being killed at the Conkle farm. And yeah, these came in packs of gum. They were probably marketing these towards little kids back then. You know, trying to get them to respect the law enforcement, try to stop some of these bad guys from running around the country. But yeah, pretty interesting. And yeah, I've got four of these. All right, our next item here is a real little item. This is actually a, a G-Man Junior badge. They would market these towards little kids, try to get them engaged and, you know, knowing who's bad and who's good or whatever and trying to help out law enforcement. And these are pretty cool, pretty small. It's about to zoom in there. Yeah. yeah, these are pretty cool. And we also keep a copy of this, the last run of Pretty Boy Floyd. This is um, a local documentary that was um, directed by David Dunlap and has our friends Kelsey and Tim in it, so you know it's awesome. But yeah, this is a great documentary that shows the full story about what happened with Pretty Boy Floyd once he came into Columbiana County. And it shows all of his movements. They talk, they div, dive in real deep with the forensics. So if you want to learn more about Pretty Boy Floyd, make sure you check out this documentary, The Last Run of Pretty Boy Floyd. And we got a lot of information from their documentary that we used in this video that you're currently watching right now. All right, looks like Cooper or Cat showed up here. But we also got a couple books here. This um, Pretty Boy, with um, written by Michael Wallace. It's a decent book. We read through it just to try to gain a little bit more information about this topic. And then another book here from Charles River Editors. 
Pretty Boy Floyd. This is a real short book here. Yeah, but you can read it. It's, it's interesting. It's nice to get some of the information out of it. All right, so that's some of our articles that we have here and artifacts. To learn more about Pretty Boy Floyd, contact the Police Museum in East Liverpool to set up a personal tour. Find the Police Museum on Facebook or email them at kelseyfhedrick at gmail.com. During the tour, you can see many artifacts related to the Pretty Boy Floyd story. The Police Museum is located at 126 West 6th Street, East Liverpool, Ohio, 43920. At the Police Museum, you can also learn much more about the history of law enforcement in Columbiana County. Also while you're in East Liverpool, make sure to visit the Thompson House, which is also the home of the East Liverpool Historical Society. The East Liverpool Historical Society contains many historically important artifacts, which includes much information about Pretty Boy Floyd. Find the East Liverpool Historical Society on Facebook or visit www.eastliverpoolhistoricalsociety.org. The East Liverpool Historical Society is located at 305 Walnut Street, East Liverpool, Ohio, 43920. Come learn more about the history of Columbia County, Ohio. Alright, that was just a brief summary of the story and death of Pretty Boy Floyd. We encourage you to do your own research so you can learn more about this. Whether you think that Pretty Boy Floyd was a Robin Hood, a product of his time, or simply a vicious killer, one thing is for sure, this Pretty Boy Floyd situation put East Liverpool, Ohio on the map. And once again, we want to thank all of our guests, and most importantly, thank you for watching. Thank <laughs> you.